Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Abide in me as I abide in you. Abide in me as I abide in you. We hear this morning these very familiar words from John's gospel. It's important to put them in context. This is the last, um, um, this is Jesus at the end of his farewell discourse in the gospel of John. He knows that he is about to um, be crucified. And so this is him saying to the disciples yet again, how important it is. All that they've learned and they've seen and what they've come to know. And so, so we hear this morning, these very um, tangible signs. Again, remember over and over again in scripture, we hear the ways that Jesus tries to connect with us are very, very often with very tangible things. So this morning we hear the words about vines and branches. One of the things that we notice is that abide is said over and over again. Actually, it's said eight times. And if you think about it, one of the things that I like to do is I think for me or for some of us that have heard some of these familiar scriptures, we just think, well, abide is abide. It's kind of a loving, holy thing, right? But if you look at the definition for abide, it means to bear patiently or to tolerate, to endure without yielding, to withstand to just kind of hang in there and bear with it all, right? I don't know about any of you, but it's this confession. One of the shows that I like on TV is Survivor. I have watched it from the beginning and I just like it, you know? And um, one of the things they have to do is they do these mental and physical tasks or tests. And one of the things they have to do some seasons is they have to stand on these little narrow pieces of wood. And as time goes by, the, the plank gets narrower and narrower. And the test is for the person that can withstand, that can stand on this very small thing for the longest time. So initially it looks like a very easy challenge because if you've ever watched the show, they do all kinds of arduous things. And this is, you just have to stand on this very small piece of wood, but you know, you can do anything, right? You can abide anything for a certain amount of time, but as time goes by and the minutes pass and it gets smaller and smaller, you see these incredibly fit people just in pain as they abide and tolerate and stand there. And of course, what motivates them is a million dollars, right? What motivates them is to be named the survivor of that season. But that's the kind of abiding Jesus is talking about this morning. And I don't think, at least for myself, I've never thought of it that way. I've thought of it as kind of a very prayerful, lyrical, abide in me and I abide in you, but not a like, how do we really abide in Jesus? How do we really abide in Jesus? Now, one of the things that came up in lectionary study this week, which is really important, is that part of the gospel reading says, and it, can, and it has been used in very punitive ways, is, you know what, if you don't abide in me, we're just going to cut you off at the quick and burn you up. And if you take that out of context, that feels like God or Jesus are just saying, you're not doing it right, you're out. And we can imagine and know that it's true that people have used it that way. But after that, I spent a fair amount of time because I had never thought about that that much, I admit. 
And I found out that, which makes perfect sense, but it's important to name and articulate, is that that means if we're separated, if we're separated from the source of our love and grace, which we as Christians call God and Jesus, if we're separated from the core, those branches wither and die. It isn't that God wants us to wither or die or that Jesus says, you're not bearing fruit, you need, to, but that happens. Some of you that have been to my house know that out in the front of our house, we have this cherry tree, which was just really beautiful and it has been there and forever and ever and ever. And the whole neighborhood knows about this tree and we love this tree. Well, a month or so ago, I don't even know when, the first windstorm happened and part of the cherry tree, a big branch of the cherry tree came off. But thanks to Sarah May, she and Calvin came over and we cleaned it up. We thought, okay, it's still gonna be okay. But boy, it was interesting to watch how it was that that part between the time that it fell off and the time that Sarah was able to come get it out of the way, how it just slowly, gradually just kind of died. And it wasn't because it wasn't loved. It was because it wasn't any more attached to the source. And then last week or the week before, Kirsten's right, I lose track of time. Sometime recently, we had another windstorm. And I went out to grab something. I came back and the tree was done. Most of the last branches were on the ground. There's one little part left that I'm determined to let have its last bloom. But what's been really interesting is one of the windows that I work at, out in front of it, you can see this tree. And to watch the neighborhood, I'm telling you, people have been grieving this tree. They stop and watch. We had a neighbor that we don't know and has never talked to us, offered to come help because they've just loved that tree. We've had people come and say, you are gonna replace that tree, aren't you? It's so sad. How is it that all of a sudden this, now we've got this other part of the tree that has slowly gone. We've got this one little part that I'm just so determined to let it have its last bloom because it's still connected to the source. So abide in me as I abide in you. Jesus is calling us at this time in this final discourse to say, if we can be connected, if you can connect to God as I'm connected to God, we will bear fruit. We will live and breathe and have our being in the source that for us as Christians, we believe is God, that we believe is Jesus. And in this farewell discourse, Jesus is saying, I'm not gonna be with you in the same way, but I am going to be with you. As we move out of this pandemic time, I think it's important for us to start to name, what have we learned? And let us not lose that. What is that source? What happened? Early on, there was a friend of mine sent me a prayer from a Franciscan um, a priest. And this is a paragraph. They say that in Wuhan, after so many years of noise, that you can hear the birds again. They say that after a just a few weeks of quiet, the sky is no longer thick with fumes, but blue and gray and clear. They say that in the streets of Assisi, people are singing to each other across the empty squares, keeping their windows open. There was tragedy in the pandemic and we certainly need to pray particularly for India. But what is it that kept us as we were connected to our source during that time, especially when we were on lockdown? How is it that we noticed that nature rejoiced? That we connected in ways that we didn't even know were possible. We found out what's important Please, God, let us not lose more lives to learn that, but let us not let them be for naught. 
Let it not be for not as I abide in me, as I abide in you. There is this new documentary film that won an Oscar, which got me on it. It's called My Octopus Teacher. And it's on Netflix. And if you ever get the chance to watch it, and if you're not a nature person, it's okay, because I'm not really either. But it's this magnificent meditation about the story of this man named Craig Foster, who retreated to South Africa to, he was um, a filmmaker, photographer. He was feeling depressed and depleted. He had a young son and was just feeling like he didn't know how to live anymore. He needed to find his center. He needed to find his center. And as a young child, he had swum in these kelp forests in Africa, in this water that human beings really aren't even supposed to be able to withstand it so cold. And he didn't take a camera and he just went in and he started to figure out and he realized that the only way that he could make this work, the only way that he could do this was if he became part of the water, if he became part of the environment. And he did. And over time, he was down in this kelp forest. And he just, I'm telling you, you need to see this. He met this, and as he talks about it, you really believe that they, I mean, they did have a relationship. He met this octopus. And what he did was he decided that he was going to go every single day and just be present and become part of the environment. He didn't wear a tank. He learned to do what's called free diving. So he had to regulate his own breath. And over time, he spent over a year with this octopus and literally became one with that environment. And what he would tell you is he was healed from the dark place that he was in. Something about being in those waters and being with that octopus, he took his son down and showed his son how to dive. There was something restorative for him about this experience about being one. And so what I would suggest as we think about today is that Jesus calls us to abide in God as God abides in us. We are called, whether it's the tree in our front yard, whether it's the new puppy in our office that reminds us of new life and new joy, whether it's being able to have to go to the depths of the ocean to find what's important to you and find your soul and reconnect, whatever it is. Our source begins with God and the end of this prayer that I used over the pandemic. All over the world, people are slowing down and reflecting. All over the world, people are looking at their neighbors in a new way. All over the world, people are waking up to a new reality, to how big we really are, to how little control we really have, to what really matters and to love. God loves us beyond our wildest imagination and calls us to remember on this day that God lives within each of us and all of you and in the world about us. Let us not begin this process of entering life again and forget what we learned. Let it not be for naught. Go ahead.